you must all be getting sick of the sight of me by now. Uh, this is the last one, I promise. Uh, so yeah, what I'll be talking about is the use of uh, camera traps for, for monitoring predators in Hawke's Bay, both for operational monitoring and also for compliance monitoring, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So just starting off with a, a quick overview of, of what I'm going to cover, I'll start off by just explaining what camera traps actually are. Some of you will no doubt be familiar with them, but some of you might, might not have seen one or used one before. Um, and I'm also going to have a, a little bit of a, uh, a plea uh, about the importance of monitoring, why it is essential that we do thorough monitoring whenever we're doing a pest control program. Um, and then I'll go on to talk about, first of all, the, the operational monitoring uh, here in Hawke's Bay and then the compliance monitoring that we're uh, planning at the moment. Okay, so to begin with, uh, what is a camera trap? So this is a, a photograph of a, a fairly common model of camera traps. Um, there are hundreds of different models on the market, but most of them work on a fairly similar principle. So they, they have an infrared motion sensor, same as you would have on a burglar alarm in your in your house, um, that's that part there. Uh, so they're triggered by an animal moving in front of the camera and they'll, they'll take either a, a photograph or a series of photographs or a short video clip. Um, so you, you can see what has moved in front of your, your camera. Um, and they, they were in, initially developed for hunters to use, but it, increasingly over the past decade or so they're being really taken up widely in research and wildlife management. Um, and the, the variety of methods that people use is probably even wider than the variety of different models of camera trap that there are on the market. There is a, a million and one different ways to use these things, but they're, they're a very, very useful tool. Uh, and this is just a, a picture of one of our camera traps actually in the field in, uh, in the Cape to City area. This was taken at Mohi Bush. There we go. Okay, so why is it important to monitor when we're doing pest control? Well, for two main reasons. It's essential, first of all, to know whether what you're doing is actually working. Um, you can be trapping or poisoning or shooting um, and expending a lot of time and resources, but unless that is actually reducing the population of the pests, then you're wasting your time and your resources. So it's absolutely imperative to know whether what you're doing is, is working. Um, but the other reason that monitoring is so important is that it tells you where and when you need to do additional control. So you know, do we need to follow this up once a year, twice a year, once every five years? And if you get that wrong, you can either be putting in far too little effort and therefore not achieving your goal, or far more effort than necessary, in which case you're, you're wasting time and resources. Um, so it really is essential. Uh, <clears throat> and often a, a lot of predator control programs uh, simply monitor the, the numbers of animals that are caught in kill traps. But that's not really enough for a couple of different reasons. One is that that there are some animals out there in, in the wild that will just never enter a trap. So recording how many you've caught tells you how many you've caught. It doesn't tell you how many are still left in the landscape. Uh, and also, e even the animals that you do catch, they can be quickly replaced by immigration from outside your control area or by breeding from the surviving animals. So even if you're taking out large numbers of animals, it doesn't necessarily follow that you are actually reducing the population to any meaningful degree. Um, so you, you sometimes hear that um, people conducting pest control are, are a bit reluctant to spend much of their budget on monitoring because they'd, they'd rather spend that money on buying more bait stations or more traps or hiring more staff. Um, so that there's a, this temptation to think that monitoring is a waste of money, but I would argue quite the opposite. If, if you're not doing thorough monitoring, it's entirely possible that you might be wasting all of your money because what you're doing <laughs> may simply not be working and you, you can't get a, a bigger waste than that. So monitoring is absolutely essential. 
Okay, so next I'd, I'd like to describe the, the methods that we're using for the, the operational monitoring in, in Cape to City. Um, and this is a, an annual uh, monitoring program. In fact, I just uh, finished putting out the, the camera traps on the weekend just before we, we started the conference here. Um, and this is a very widespread um, placement of cameras to, to monitor predator populations over the, the large area of Cape to City. So we have um, 38 cameras within the, the Cape to City area. That's uh, these cameras here. They're, they're all spaced a, a minimum of two kilometres apart. So uh, the same cat or the same stoat is very unlikely to be photographed by more than one camera. Each camera is a, an independent sampling unit. Uh, and then we also have 30 cameras just outside the Cape to City area, placed at, at a similar sort of spacing, um, to give us some benchmark for, for comparison with, with the control area. And the way that we'll be analysing the, the results as they come in is through an approach called occupancy modelling. Um, and what this does is, is it estimates, first of all, the, the proportion of the landscape that's actually occupied by the species of interest, whether it's cats or stoats or what have you. Um, it, it can also give you a rough estimate of predator abundance, um, either at specific locations or just averaged across all of your cameras in, in the landscape. Um, and it will also estimate the probability that if you just go out to a random point within Cape to City, what, what are the chances that you will encounter a cat or the chances that you will encounter a stoat? Um, and finally, by, by monitoring uh, in consecutive years, occupancy modelling can estimate the, the rates of local extinction. So this is parts of the landscape where predators were last year and this year they're gone. Um, and also the rates of recolonisation, so somewhere where we, there were no cats last year and we might detect some this year. Um, and so that the aim is in a, a successful predator control program, your, late, your rate of local extinction will be greater than your rate of local recolonisation. It tells you that you're ahead of the game. Um, and the, the graph I have up here is um, just stolen by a, from a paper by a colleague of mine, Andrew Bankson, in Australia. He, he was the, the first person that I know of to use this particular modelling approach for a predator control operation. Um, in his case, it was, it was fox control in, in eastern Australia. But it's just a good example of, of um, how well this, this modelling method can work. So you have here... Um, four consecutive seasons where they, they sampled with, with 20 cameras across a, a very large area. Um, and up here, this is, this is the estimated proportion of sites that were occupied by foxes. Um, so you can see there that the, the occupancy of foxes in that landscape did fall really very substantially over the course of about a year, over four successive monitoring periods. So it's a, it's a very good indication that that fox control operation was a success, at least in terms of reducing fox numbers. Whether, whether or not it produced any biodiversity benefit, of course, is a, is a separate question. Okay, so that's how we're going about the, the operational monitoring. Um, but as, uh, as Mark just mentioned, that there's also a need for monitoring for compliance. So once 75% or more of landholders sign up to Cape to City, this is going to become binding and there's, there's no point in having a legally binding agreement if you don't have a monitoring method that can tell you whether or not individual landholders are actually uh, complying with their obligations. Um, so this is a, a, a map of all the, the properties in the Cape to City area and the black dots are, are the network of, of kill traps, uh, some of which are out and some of which are still to be rolled out. Um, but there are 163 properties in that footprint. So obviously my 38 cameras that I'm putting out are not going to give us information about every individual property in there. So what are we going to do to make sure that there aren't some properties in here who are not holding up their part of the bargain. Because if, if there are any um, 
weak links, so to speak, people who are not, um, not pulling their weight, that could undermine the, the effectiveness of the control program for everybody else. So we need a monitoring method that can tell us if individual landholders are doing their bit. So the, we're still deciding exactly how we might go about this, but the suggestion at the moment is that we will look at the, we will do more intensive monitoring at the more localised scale and look at the number of predator detections per 100 camera tra trap days. So it's very similar to a tracking tunnel index. Uh, so it would just be expressed as a, a percentage, so 5% of cameras on any given night picked up a, a cat or, or, or something like that. Um, and we tested this approach using some data from a, a previous trial on Waiteri Station here in Hawke's Bay, uh, where there was an intensive uh, cat and ferret control operation. Um, and we saw the camera trap rate decline substantially. So you can see here from ferret, for ferrets, it went down from 6.4% to 0.4%. And for cats, it went down from 27 to 0.2%. So we know that was a successful operation because we monitored it very intensively and about 90% of the cats were removed on Waiteri Station. So we're taking that as a, a benchmark for a, a successful operation. And, and based on that, the suggestion is that the compliance threshold should be that um, after control, the, the camera trap rate should be less than 1%. Um, but as, as Mark said, that can be updated as, as we gain more knowledge, we might decide that that's too high or too low and it might be adjusted accordingly. And I am running out of time, sorry, so I'll have to fly through it. Um, I won't go through this one in detail, but basically this is just showing that the, the more uh, sampling effort you put out, the more accurate your results come. So these very wide error bars show that your, your result is not very accurate. And then towards this end with far larger numbers of cameras out for a longer period of time, you get a much more precise estimate. So based on this, we've estimated that you probably need at least 240 to 280 camera trap days in order to get a, a reliable estimate. So that might, for example, be 10 cameras placed out for 28 days, 20 cameras for 14 days, and so on. And then the one remaining problem is what to do about very small properties. There are some lifestyle style blocks that are just a few hectares. You can't fit 10 cameras in, in a few hectares not unless you just put them all in one cluster and that's fairly pointless. Um, so there are a couple of possibilities that we're considering there. One would be to monitor clusters of adjacent properties, so divide them up into areas of at least 100 hectares and that might comprise five or six separate properties and monitor those as a lump. Or alternatively, we might, uh, for, for very small properties, we might forego the, the camera monitoring and just rely on using the wireless trap network to ensure that the landowners are servicing their traps as, as they should. Um, or of course, we could use some combination of those two techniques. Um, one other uh, complication is that of course, people have owned cats in Cape to City, when we're not trying to remove people's owned cats, so we don't want to count them in our index of feral cat abundance. And this, this is a photo from the Cape to City footprint, and you can see that that cat's wearing a collar. So as long as we ensure that people have their owned cats wearing a collar, we can make sure they're not counted in the, the index, and we're not uh, uh, issuing people with an infringement uh, for having cats on their property, when in actual fact it was just a pet. Okay, so um, just very quickly, the management implications of this. Um, the, the suggested approach that, that we've come up with is that properties of 100 hectares would have nine cameras on them to monitor for compliance. And then as properties get larger, we would add one more camera for every individual, uh, every 10 hectares, up to a maximum of 20 cameras. Um, and we would need at least 280 camera trap days, so that's 10 cameras for 28 days. Um, and based on that, we would be looking for a camera trap rate of less than 1%. Um, this, this can be refined as we get more knowledge that we may find that that's too low or too high. Um, and regardless of what happens with the, the camera trap monitoring, um, we should also, we suggest, monitor 
the trapping effort that landowners are putting in uh, using the wireless network monitoring system. And sorry, I went a bit over time there, so we've probably run out of time for questions. Sorry about that. Is that something that AI might do in the future? Yes, very, very good question. That's our number one priority at the moment. We're working on getting some computer software that will go through these images very quickly, automatically for us. At the moment, we go through these ourselves. And um, to give you an idea, we, we got several hundred thousand images last year. Um, and it took me an awful long time to go through those. So I'm really looking forward to that automated software.